but the extra strong Roman concrete. Fully hydraulic. Natural welded connections. It's the structural engineer. engineering podcast. Hi, welcome to this week's episode of the Structural Engineering Podcast. <laughs> I'm Zach. And I'm Max. <laughs> And we're here to talk structures. Oh, who are we? We're kicking this one off, like usual. With a good fishing story. With a good fishing story and a news article about structural engineering. Do you know I went fishing today, Max? No. Oh. I do. Yeah, you do. Did you I catch anything? I caught nothing. I know. You know, actually, the best thing was I caught a pine cone. Really? Yeah. From underwater? Yeah. That'd be kind of fun. Yeah. Not really. I'd rather <laughs> catch a big... Big trout. Did you take a picture? A pine cone? No, I was disappointed in myself. Yeah. But better than a boot. No, I guess no, a boot would be better. Way better. Yeah. Do you read anything good? Yeah, actually, this week is uh, is great too. The the news article, or it's not actually a news article, but it's a, it's something that will will be, uh, well correlated to what we're talking about. Huh. But it's something that I saw from a, uh, another professional okay on LinkedIn that I met early in my career um, who is and practices as a structural engineer in Washington cool okay so he went up to um, uh, Alaska and evaluated the earthquake damage whoa yeah fun yeah so, do you remember what the magnitude of that thing was six and so it, there was to, to what I've read was very, 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 very minor structural damage huh. um, from what I've seen on, on different news stations and things like that. There was a big sinkhole that opened up on one, like an, a highway um, exit. That was just like this, the earth was just gone. Yeah. And then, like one car, it was, it, it's actually interesting, like one car was on the part that sank and like just the one piece of road in the middle of the sinkhole that like survived, the car was on. Oh man. It was pretty wild. But uh, anyway, so yeah this is pretty quick but the guy that went up there uh and reviewed these buildings um found that structurally they're they're good there's some minor damage huh. um they, like yeah the minor damage i was talking to before with from articles i read but this is like you know first person um he went and evaluated a lot of schools up there yeah and the big thing that that he took out of it was that structural engineers need to have more say in non-structural items really a lot of I think he said three or four uh, schools um, exit ways were blocked by brick that had fallen off the building because the <laughs> the brick ties were inadequate yeah. or rusted, and um, yeah, they had a lot of facade failures that caused um, people not to be able to get out of the building. That's wild. And be able to use the exits that were by code needed to get out of the building. I wouldn't even think of that. Um, the other thing that he saw was drop ceilings. Um, Dropping. Oh, a lot of them failed. <laughs> a lot of them failed. And not only did they f fail, but the lights fell too. And the lights are pretty heavy. Yeah. So he said a couple of most, well, most of the schools you went to, the uh, the heavier light fixtures were actually anchored into the roof. So they didn't fall. The ceilings fell, but they stayed. Huh. Um, but a lot of like just those panel lights um, came down. And again, you know, we, we get hired and we think through the building, but, you know, structurally, okay, if the building stands, great. But, you know, that means of egress, whether that's on the architect or, you know, us. Like, someone needs to think that step between the exit and, and the structure. Yeah. The, and, the, and then the non-structural elements. So, I think I I, I want to say right now that I foresee a code change due to that earthquake. Really? That will drive non-structural elements to be more regimented. Yeah. In the next 10 years. I could see it. That's Coach, it's, it's not something I've ever really thought about. I, I think from because this is it's a good size earthquake that yeah. happened in an area like that's had massive earthquakes before. Nineteen sixty four had like a nine point four earthquake that took down everything. Yeah, and big code changes has have happened since then, and there is you know sections in the ASC seven that discusses non structural elements and design of them, but. Uh, as a structural engineer, how often do you do that, right? Yeah. Not very often. That's left to someone else to think through. Um, but for our buildings to be safe the whole, you know, the whole way, sure, the building is in class, but can people even get out the doors? Yeah. You know, I think taking time to review and approve brick anchors 
I think is something that'd be really important for a structural engineer to do because they understand those loads. They understand. Yeah, but I think like making that process. gap that the brick might block the doors is kind of a leap because you look at this and you'll say, well, that's not life safety. You know, unless someone is standing at the wall, under the wall. Right now, it would be ridiculous, but yeah. So to meet code though, these exits exits are supposed to be clear for people to leave. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think right there, and then let's say a drop ceiling falls on someone, they need to go out that door for the ambulance. That door is blocked by bricks. <laughs> I, you know, like the, the whole code is trying to, with you know, there's requirements for exiting. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to be able to do all those things. And just because a building is to code, doesn't mean it can go through every earthquake. Yeah, not There's different all. types not of earthquakes. Course. There's different levels of earthquakes. So it's just, it's all statistics based on how you design that building. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe it does go through a massive earthquake the building's not designed for, and people need to get out. Yeah. And now all your exits are blocked. Or not all of them, but the majority of them are, you know. Uh -huh. Even one exit could, could kill people. So I think it'll be an interesting thing to see. Um, he, he had a ton of photos and, and a lot of... Um, of interesting things to talk about and he started really pushing that whole non um, structural element stuff he said in his practice um, he's going to start reviewing emphasizing and that emphasizing that, yeah. that in his drawings uh, he said even if he can't get paid for it like to take that responsibility he still wants he just, to yeah he said he just i imagine after seeing that you changes your you whole perspective change your perspective on yeah things. yeah he says the way he'll design has changed now uh, from the things he saw, detailing wise. Huh. So, that's my my news for the week. I, mo mostly, I just want to talk about the non structural stuff. Yeah. So I think cool cool little thing that came out of uh, that earthquake. Luckily, um, no buildings killed people. That's good. That's cool. That's an interesting story. I had not thought about that. But you know, today we are talking about earthquakes. This is going to be part one of a two parter. Uh, part one is sort of intro to seismology, right? Which is in the spectrum of earthquakes, what we know the least about, because we're not geologists. All right. Pause. Say there. I can't remember if I started the camera. <laughs> I think I'm pretty sure I did, but yeah, we're recording. <laughs> Sorry, I just like I was, oh fuck. <laughs> that was. <laughs> Didn't we have a, a cue thing, like touch? Right, that was our pause. Remember oh. like, from many weeks ago? You do this, then we like oh, is that stop right? for okay. a second. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, okay. so <laughs> so we're going to get into a little bit of seismology. Um, we've got a couple of books that we were just refreshing on. This is a really cool one. We just got into the office. Facts for Steel Buildings, uh, provided by the AISC. Um, for for free. free. It's size design. For free, if you're a member. Um, so anybody listening that does not have this book, is this newer? I mean, it doesn't seem it like is. That. Yeah, is so it? they've got a whole bunch of, of different of these facts for steel buildings mm -hmm. booklets, and uh, they're actually free for everyone. That's awesome. Yeah, this is a really great book, and it's a good intro to steel design for earthquakes. It's got colored pictures. Aren't it? Colored pictures, graphs all over the place, um, and it really does cover a lot of different components of steel design in uh, earthquakes, so it's awesome. Um, and then what's that book? This book is even better. It's bigger. <laughs> it's bigger, so it's better. This is the Seismic Design Review Book for the California uh, PE oh, nice. and SE uh, Seismic Test. So that thing's got everything. This, yeah, this book goes through everything from theory and what earthquakes are, all the way through designing every system there is out there. Sweet. That is codified, more or less. It summarizes all the design. Hmm. And it goes through examples and yeah, nice, pretty good, pretty good. Pretty I'm gonna good. quiz you after this from ah, from shit. this book. Oh, so an earthquake. What's an earthquake? Let's start off before that. Have you ever been in an earthquake? It's a good question. I have one. Yeah, in Pennsylvania. Really? Yeah. Huh. Second story of an office building. It Ooh. more felt like I was just a little bit dizzy. Okay. Like you know. Yeah, Just like a couple did I stand up drinks. too quickly? Did I uh, a couple too many drinks? Yeah, uh, and then it stopped, and I looked up, and it was an earthquake. And my oh, oh thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, but that was it. Okay. You, yeah. Yeah, I've gone through a couple in Washington. Um, there was one pretty big one. 
I can't remember what the size was, but it was in like early 2000s, <laughs> somewhere in there. And uh, it shook a lot. Yeah, it really? Was, it, was, it, was an, it was a legit earthquake. Stuff's falling off the shelves? Yeah. Well, oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I was at my grandparents, and, like, everything higher than the floor fell. Wow, that's cool. Sort of. It was very weird. Like, you're saying, it's like, it's, um, gosh, there's, like, a circus, uh, ride or something. Like, you're trying to walk, but you can't. Like, it's, you're really dizzy. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was really weird when the whole world's shaking. On the Mercalli scale, that would be a four. Hmm. Yeah. For some reason, I want to say it was in a six, uh, like a. But the Mercalli is a weird one. That one doesn't like count or anything. That's right. like, yeah, you get there. I think it was a magnitude six. You keep talking. I'm gonna grab my phone. I'm gonna look it up. Five felt by nearly everyone. Many awakened. Some dishes, windows broken. When I was really young in the '90s, I slept through an earthquake. Really? Yeah. That seems like a kid could do that pretty easily. Yeah. Huh. Hmm. All right, well, while you're looking for what type of earthquake or what size of this thing, I'm going to start with what causes earthquakes, which I think most people probably know. You already have it? No. Oh. Okay. So the earth is made out of tectonic plates that sit on molten lava, <laughs> on magma. What's There's a better term for this. The, uh, oh, the molten core of the planet, I guess. So there's, I think, seven tectonic plates. And then a couple subplates, mm -hmm. and these things just shift around and bump into each other. What is a plate? Uh, uh, I mean, I have no idea. A good definition. I mean, it's just a yeah. giant chunk of land, huge. Like a lot of continents are pretty much a plate. Yeah. But it is an unbroken piece of land. <laughs> okay man yeah what is so the, the book i got here says yeah. there's 20 independent tectonic float uh plates floating on the softer inner layer 20 total total does yeah. it split it up into major and minor no so yeah just to yeah. summarize yours <laughs> to correct mine yeah okay so the one i went through was a 6.8 oh that's pretty big yeah and then the one i slept through was a 5.8 ah, i can see through that yeah Oh, man. Okay, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, these things are, uh, all these plates move around. They're shaky. They're shaky. There's a soft layer below them. They kind of bump into each other. Some of them subduct. Mm -hmm. One goes over the other. Some of them slip. Right. Some of them pull. And there's a whole bunch of different types of uh, faults attributed to this different type of movement. Um, I think we've got four categories, right? Generally. Generally, yeah. But let's let's take a step back. What causes earthquakes beyond just tectonic plates? Hmm. What do you mean? So, there's volcanic eruptions cause earthquakes. Oh, oh, yeah. Additional things that additional things yeah, that yeah, cause yeah. them that the code may or USGS may or may not mm -hmm. consider. Yeah. Um, explosions. Man-made explosions. Mm-hmm. Um, fracking. Fracking. Another man-made thing. And then what we're just talking about, but sudden dislocation of segments of the Earth's crust. That's the big one. So your, your tectonic plates. Um, but, if, you know, but you just tell the whole story. Yeah, that's, um, yeah. I mean, Oklahoma's having loads of earthquakes all of a sudden after they started fracking. Yeah. So <sighs> Correlation. Yeah, isn't always, slippery in that Earth up. Isn't always... Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> all right, I mean, where do these things happen then? They, they can happen in Oklahoma, which is in the middle of the continent. Yeah. And most of these plates pretty much make up continents. So you can have intracontinental quakes. Yeah. But a majority, a vast majority of them happen on the perimeter of these boundaries. Um, there's a giant boundary it's called Spring of Fire. That thing goes down to um, uh, Hawaii. Oh, but that's not on a, that's not exactly on a plate, is it? Oh, uh, okay. They have volcanoes. I know, but usually the volcanoes are kind <laughs> on of the, by a ridge. Yeah. Okay, so the Ring of Fire is not. <laughs> but the west coast of the United States is. Yeah, but where else in the country have had the craziest earthquakes? There's one area 
specifically in the country that beyond the West Coast has had severe earthquakes. Talking Tennessee? Yeah. 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 In, in 1811, Tennessee gets shook. It's all that good music. <laughs> had, uh, based off of your uh, Marcelli. Marcali? Marcali. Okay, it might be a Selly. Cali, Selly, I don't know. Um, but hit the, that scale goes up to like 12, and, and that region was was up there. But did they say what it, what this early 19-whatever uh, earthquake was? 1811. 18, oh, no, that's a so long that's, time ago. Yeah, they weren't recording it, but they but from historical, you know, writings, Records, yeah. they were it able was to pretty big. Yeah, get a good understanding of it. Oh, I guess it's, I mean, it's saying right here, it's greater than a... a Seven. That seven on that scale, on yeah. the Cali scale, which is pretty big. Um, that, that scale goes up to a seven, um, but a s or sorry, it goes up to a twelve. Yeah. Oh my god, find this. All thing. right, all right, all right, right here. There we go. But a seven, damage negligible in building. Oh, that's you know this isn't going of good design. Of good design. Of good design. For the slight <laughs> to moderate in well built <laughs> structures. Yeah. Considerable damage. In poorly built structures. Or structures not thought of for earthquakes. Right? Or any structure in 1811. Made out of timber. Yeah. And some rocks. <laughs> rocks. So, yeah. Okay, well, Tennessee can have quakes too. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so they can happen anywhere. They mostly happen uh, around these tectonic plate borders. Um, the uh, North American plate uh, goes down the west coast of the United States. And the eastern side of it in the Atlantic Ocean is pretty much right in the center of the ocean. So it's a bit far from that. Yeah. Yeah. Which then causes the west coast to have a lot of earthquakes. And that's why the west coast does versus the east coast. Yep. Because of the plates that are over there. Um, and the, the Cascadia Fault, which is the big one that is, uh, is being talked about a lot in, in, in the northern, northwest you know, mm -hmm. area. It hasn't. It has like a reoccurring time of three to five, or two to five hundred years, or something like that, that it goes off, and it's yeah. been almost four hundred years since the last time it's gone off. So, it's been in the news a lot. They do. Uh, the New York Times wrote on this a couple of years ago, and, and caused a lot of, a lot of fear. Um, the um, Seattle has started um, posting on buildings that they deem non-safe during earthquakes. For the public to make their own decision if they want to go in the building or not. Really? And there's a lot of skyscrapers in, not a lot, there's a handful or two skyscrapers in a specific area of Seattle. Uh, Seattle is mostly built on some um, bad soils that actually amplify earthquakes. Uh -huh. um, and they weren't designed for those because they weren't known. <laughs> um, and so it's actually, that's that's a whole other news story, but there's been uh, there's been some lawsuits on um, due to lost business. Interesting. I've got some stats from this book here that just lists through some recurrence um, intervals um, for different quakes. So this is Northern California, so San Andreas Fault. Uh, recurrent relationships, recurrence, suggests that earthquakes with a magnitude between 6.5 and 7, similar to the 1989 Loma Prieta, which we've mentioned a couple times, yep. um, will occur approximately one time every 100 years. Um, Let's see, so magnitude 8 earthquakes, like the 1906 San Francisco event earthquake, are one every 300 years. So these things, um, the way the recurrence kind of parallels wind a little bit, you know, that we look at these things in a recurrence interval mm -hmm. sense. Yep. Um, I think, you know, wind speeds now are one in 700 years, one in 300 for, um, depending on your, depending on the occupancy category. Yeah. Wind's uh, not real, though. Wind's, are. <laughs> yeah. Wind comes from the sky, it can't yeah. be real. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah i mean they could they can happen uh they're less likely to happen on the east coast so uh they're less worried about but apparently these intercontinental earthquakes are harder to predict yeah and can be really damaging and a lot of the codes in those areas don't make any accommodation for them because they can be so rare right um, and usgs values in that region are anything significant due to that yeah um now we did just have one in colorado a few months ago western colorado has a has a fault in it yeah we had one it was up the i-70 corridor huh. 
Yeah. Like a 3.4 or 3.8, somewhere in there. That's just occurred a couple months ago. There are a lot of earthquakes every year. Yeah, yeah a lot. Yeah, a lot. I mean, all over the world. Thousands and thousands every year. Yeah. The USGS has a nice map of these things, and you can just watch them occur more or less. Um, oh, through the day. Through yeah. the day, and, and many, most of these are very small. One, two, three, four magnitude right on the Richter scale earthquakes. Yeah. Um, and they just happen all over the place at all, all times. But you're probably not going to feel them. Right. Yeah, Oklahoma's having 3.0s a couple times a week. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah. Not, they're not to fours yet, but... They're getting there. They'll get there. <coughs> They're growing up. Oklahoma will become a high seismic zone. So while we keep saying all these numbers, let's talk a little bit about measurement types. All okay. right. So the very first one, and the most common one by far, is my the Richter favorite. Scale. Yeah. Mr. Richter. Mr. Richter. Which is fairly old, the scale. Yeah. Mr. Richter made this very nice scale, but it's, it's logarithmic. That's good to know. But it is based on really specific things. It is the movement of some measuring device at a very specific distance from the earthquake's epicenter. Yep. So unless you have all that information perfectly, you can't really get a good Richter scale. You can just guess, but yeah. it's not a it's not a val it's not a true value. It's not like this weighs ten pounds. Right. This Richter is ten. You know, it's just a relative ish kind of thing. And they they bring up in this article is. That's why um, earthquakes often in the news come in at all sorts of different numbers because everyone can get a different Richter scale value. Right. Close, but not you know not the same. Uh, it was also developed by Gutenberg. Mr. Gutenberg. Mr. Gutenberg. In nineteen and yes, yeah, so, so in nineteen fifty six, Gutenberg and Richter developed the the Richter scale. Whoa. I don't think, I feel like I know the name Gutenberg, but I don't remember why. Yeah, I don't either. He's just a guy? Well, I don't you got know. Enough? <laughs> How many, is it, we're doing live. Oh, man. Live updates. Yeah, I've got C, CF Richter. Um, but, so, you know, after the Richter scale. Oh, the Gutenberg Bible. Oh. Is that the first printed thing? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's yep. why you think okay. about it. Um, anyway, so... <laughs> you guys are you not know that. So, the Richter scale worked for a while, but it's just, you know, kind of hard to measure accurately. I think I know how to put that in perspective. What do you got? To... It would approximately take a thousand magnitude five on the Richter scale earthquakes to release the same amount of energy as a single magnitude seven. So, That's seven a is a thousand times a five. Well... It doesn't mean it's not hard to measure. But no, no, I'm just saying oh, relative, like yeah, talking relative about the scale, how, understanding how that scale works. A log scale. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and I didn't realize it was log until I looked this up, which sounds, I mean, I'm an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> the basis of the show is I Max and I are an idiot, so <laughs> you're learning with us. I thought it was a square, but it's log, which mm -hmm. is it's a lot. Yeah. Um, but that's, yeah. That's pretty cool. So, okay, so after Richter, the next one they moved on to, and in, in what is commonly used today um, by geologists, would be the moment magnitude scale. So the Richter goes from 1 to 9, so does the moment magnitude. It's more or less the same scale. I don't have that one. You don't have that one? Oh, no. California doesn't believe in that one. Yeah, yeah. It believes in the, uh, <laughs> the Richter and Mercalli. The Mercalli. Okay, well, moment magnitude... From the 1 to 7 is the same as the Richter. And after 7, the moment magnitude scale tends to be a little more accurate. It didn't say if it's a, is it higher or lower or whatnot. The, mo the moment magnitude scale, let's see here, goes off. Again, you cannot measure it like everything else here. Right. But it's easier to estimate. It's basically how much energy is released. Um, Kilojoules. Uh, I mean, energy does it, yeah, kilojoules. All right. Yeah. You know. Just giving people uh, um, an idea. Okay, so the moment magnitude is based on the modulus of rigidity in the rock, the amount of slip that has occurred, and the surface area of the fault. If you can go underground <laughs> and determine all of these things, you'll know exactly what it is. Okay, so they're doing that often. Yeah. 
So they made a new scale that they still don't know how to measure exactly, but they can guess better. Okay. And that is the one that they use now. Okay. Which can be converted to Richter scale. Yeah. Um, so you'll always hear Richter on the news, but moment magnitude, I guess, is more what a geologist uses. Then the third scale, which is way more fun, because it just talks about real things to me, uh, is the Mercalli, modified Mercalli, or perhaps Mercalli. <laughs> what did you say? Mercalli. 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 I'm calling it the modified Mercalli. Mercalli. Yeah. And this goes from 1 to 12. And it basically just measures how much damage happened. Yeah. So this is how much energy actually got to a specific place. That's much more helpful. Why is any of this helpful? Well, you gotta know what to design to. Okay. <laughs> so modified, modified Mercalli starts, you know, at one. Uh -huh. Nobody feels it. Very few under especially favorable conditions. So some people might feel it like, in very favorable. Yeah. Sorry, some cats and dogs will feel it. Yeah, cats and dogs maybe. Yeah. Let's shoot to like, I don't know, nine here. Damage considerable in specially designed structures. Well-designed frame structures thrown out of plumb. Damage great in sustain, sub, damage great in substantial buildings, so many buildings, uh, with partial collapse. Buildings shifted off the foundations. Mm -hmm. That's pretty rough. A lot of bad stuff happened. Yeah. Going up to 12, damage total. Everything <laughs> is falling down. <laughs> Objects thrown into air. Yeah. There's a couple of movies where the earth opens up and everything falls They're in. They're always so. 12s in movies. There's... <laughs> Things are always thrown in the air. Yeah. I think there's always Richter scale of 12 as well. In the movies. What? Yeah. It only goes to 9. I know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think on the movies they say it's a twelve. <laughs> it might. It could be a twelve. Sure. Um. All right. Principal effects of an earthquake. <laughs> <laughs> what happens? All right. Frequency of an earthquake. They generally range between point two hertz and one hundred hertz. One hundred hertz is pretty fast. That is. Point two is what I picture in my head. Yeah, something along that line. Yeah, give us perspective. A couple of seconds. How do you, how do you visualize that? I mean, I'm rocking. Okay. Like this is how I think an earthquake. Yeah. Let's air count in one hundred fifty. So I guess I'm at hertz. Yeah. I picture hertz. Okay. But yeah, point two. I mean, that's really slow. Um, but the Earth can move several meters, and depending on the type of fault, a lot of the movement can be permanent. So the Earth can just leap up a couple meters. Or right. shift over a couple meters. Or both. Or both. Same time. The direction of this can be up or over, which when you get into building design, it's really important to keep in mind. You know, the lateral system definitely gets all of the attention. I think if you're just rolling through. I mean, you know, it's the first thing you think about is the lateral system in a building when you're dealing with seismic. But mm -hmm. you're going to have a lot of seismic load in the vertical direction as well. Right. I want to make sure that got pitched in there. Yeah, you will. Um. <sighs> <laughs> um, and then I, how do earthquakes affect buildings, right? So as the earth is moving, the building has a lot of inertia, you know, and the heavier the building is, the more inertia it's going to have. Mm -hmm. So the earth below the building shifts over, it may move up, and in order to keep from moving, the building stiffness applies a force to the structural elements. Yeah. And that's basically it, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but the, yeah, the, the heavier this building, the more it doesn't want to move. So the earth shifts over really quickly, and due to the inertia of the building is saying, I'd like to stay over here for a little bit longer. Right. Like um, a car accident. Like a car accident. Yeah. Yeah. Your body is trying to stay. Just in, keep on rolling. Keep on rolling. It's like the opposite, and the car <laughs> is stopping instantly. Yeah, um, and so that's, yeah, the airbag yeah. comes in. That's your So, so a nice, really light building isn't going to feel the effects quite as much. But, I mean, it might not be as stiff. Uh, then there's also a component of stiffness here. Right. Right. So, a depending on the stiffness of your building, 
it's going to parallel, or it's, let's see, it's going to feel the frequency of the ground vibration differently. Mm -hmm. The closer the stiffness of the building is to the frequency of the ground vibration, the more of that energy is going to be translated into the building, and the more it's going to shake, and that displacement is going to grow. And you'd be sort of in the harmonic of the building at that point. Right. Yeah. That'd be pretty bad. Now, what do you know about seismic waves? There's a couple. Okay. Which one's scary the most? Ah. I'm thinking of the movie Tremors. <laughs> oh, jeez. Those things. <laughs> so we got um, compression waves, shear waves, and surface waves. Which ones do you think causes cause the most damage? The most damage. I, I, I guess I want to say surface. Okay. Shear waves would be pretty bad. Yeah, well, I'm going to stick with compression. So shear waves and surface waves are the waves that cause the, cause the most uh, structural damage. Oh, shoot. So a compression wave is a wave, also known as a primary wave, uh, they're the faster of the seismic waves, and as a result, usually arrive first. Uh, similar to sound waves that compress and expand material as they travel, P waves have both vertical and horizontal components. <laughs> so, but that does not cause the most damage. And as you can see, we have a graph here. We'll put this in the show notes as well. In the in, in it shows in the graph in the first five seconds is your P wave comes through and the acceleration of your P wave is, is very minor. Uh, the next thing that comes through is your shear wave. And um, the shear waves also is the secondary wave. Right? Mm -hmm. You got your primary and now your secondary. Uh, it's slower than the P wave, the S wave. Um, arrives with their sin with significant component of side to side and up and down motion so that the ground shaking is both horizontal and vertical but more extreme uh, than your shear wave. Or sorry, your your compression compression wave, and the S waves are most effective in damaging structures near the epicenter. Hmm. Um, and then our last type of wave here is our surface wave. Um, can also be called a love wave. Ooh. Yeah. Uh, surface waves are the slowest of the seismic waves, and they may or may not even form. Their motion is restricted to near the ground surface. These waves damp out much um, more slowly than P and S waves and are thought to cause the greatest damage far from epicenter. Huh. So, shear waves closest to the epicenter, surface waves furthest from the epicenter cause the most damage to the structure. Okay. Um, and I think this, this graph here, we have time versus acceleration really kind of speaks to that and... and uh, and that will be in our show notes. Yeah. Um, and something to, to take a look at. So it's good to know your, your waves. Know your quakes. Know your yeah. waves. Know your quakes. Know your waves. Um, it is important, you know, if you're designing these kind of things to understand where they come from and why. A little bit at least. Yeah. <laughs> Which is about what we know. <laughs> yeah. So. I don't know. I think at this point, then we move over to uh, ASC 7 and do some earthquake design. Unless you got anything else in the <laughs> pre-engineering component of this. Um, yeah, so here's some earthquakes. Um, so, I mean, I, I think right before we jump to ASC 7, we can go through a list of what damage earthquakes cause. Okay. Give, like, a good idea of, like, what it what damage it causes so then it and and so you kind of understand more of why you're designing certain things so there's a good list in here um it says the inertial forces generated by the severe ground shaking changes in the physical properties of the foundation soil um so consolidation settling liquid liquefaction uh direct fault displacement at the site of the structure mm -hmm. so there is a lot of or not a lot. There's some things in the in the code if you're building directly on a fault, uh, yeah, which does do happen in California. You're yeah, pretty much right on the fault. Uh, so landslides are a big one. Um, seismically induced water waves, such as seismic sea waves or tsunamis. Um, so designing there is coastal regions you have to design for tsunami loading on your structure. Um, and that goes along with. You know, having big water tanks, I would think, in your building, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of um, 
Tall buildings have fire suppression tanks at certain levels, it's you know, big chunks of water. Um, and then uh, there's a lot of uh, fires induced by earthquakes yeah, as well right due to their structural right. damage. Yep. So those aren't exactly everything that structurally you know is caused, but some non you know some things that are you know potentially on your building site or could occur to your building site or due to earthquakes. Um, and like we talked about earlier, you know, earthquakes cause a lot of non-structural damage. The building's still standing, but other mm -hmm. components could fail. Um, and then, yeah, right into your building, falling, falling over, not being plumbed, mm -hmm. things yielding. But, it, I mean, in a lot of earthquake design, depending on the occupancy category of the building, you're not trying to make the building survive an earthquake. You're not trying to make the building survive you're trying yeah. to make the people inside survive collapse prevention collapse prevention right. is most of seismic design yeah unless it's a critical structure it's it, going to fail right if it goes through the design earthquake yeah your building needs to be scrapped yeah and i would say majority of the public has no clue about that yeah <laughs> so uh but yeah in our next segment we'll dive into asc7 uh probably asc710 we're both the most familiar Mm -hmm. With that, uh, with yeah, recent code changes, it's ASC 716. Uh, but we'll go through ASC 710 with seismic design and, and go through each level and each step that you take through, starting in Chapter 11, and just and going from there and, and kind of understanding um, how and why you do certain things. So Sounds good to me. Thanks for joining us this week. In the show notes, you'll find everything that you need to know <laughs> <laughs> and on how to reach us. So feel free to do so. You have a great rest of your day. Catch you next time. Boom.